this podcast is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. Kindly consider a contribution through Patreon or PayPal. Links are in the details box. Patreon is a monthly subscription that you can cancel anytime. And PayPal is a one-time donation. Any amount is appreciated. And follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The handle, The Beirut Banyan. And you can find us on our YouTube channel with the same name. And you can start watching the episodes as they're released. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching. I'm Rani Shatah. And this is The Beirut Banyan. Before we jump into heavy terrain, I should acknowledge from the start Nadim Shahadi is now number one for this podcast. This is your <laughs> fifth appearance. So I shall congratulate you from the start. And yes, you are you are you. Uh, you were there at the beginning, the first ten episodes that I re- that I recorded before starting the podcast. You were generous, uh, you gave me two hours of your time. And I think our friendship really started that day. I think we've been friends really since that moment. We've known each other for a long time, but I sense that there's some, there's yeah. there was a bond that uh, that that was established. So I look forward to any conversation with you, Nadim. Awesome. And Drew, Thank I mean, you. thankfully we're friends, but way before this podcast started. But I almost sense that maybe uh, we've grown a little closer. And uh, this is now your mm. third appearance on on the podcast. So you just need to come on three more times, and you can kick Nadim out of his place, and we'll get you settled. And uh, oh, you, uh, I mean, Nadim is a very, very worthy number one slot. So uh, someone that you know, I met Nadim quite a few years ago, and I've always doing a PhD on Lebanon. He's a he's a preeminent name, of course. So I've always learned so much from your writing, Nadim, and also from listening to you speak. So. It's an honor to be on with you, and it's an honor, Thank of course, you. Ronnie, as a friend and and someone who, you know, we talked about like on my first appearance, you know, one of the best tours of any city, I think that that can be given, um, and I think that absolutely, this is a worthy, yeah. absolutely worthy endeavor, and I love the fact that you're doing it. I really want to support its growth and and see this see this really um, take its place in the pantheon of good Middle East and Lebanese podcasts and inform places of information. You know, I need these especially, sound bites. Especially yeah, <laughs> especially during during the revolution. I mean you were the chronicler of the revolution at the time. It was fantastic. I was really happy, Nadim, when you told me that when you would take your walks throughout Manhattan and you'd, you'd be listening to the daily episodes, sometimes two episodes a day in the middle of the protests. And I and I really appreciated that. And I didn't really pay attention to how many people were listening back then. The numbers grew exponentially and they keep yeah. growing. It's almost like this year has been both very, very difficult and, and tragic in many ways, but in terms of uh, mm-hmm. maybe um, maybe just wanting to reflect and as you said, chronicle and document, I think, I mean, there's no better time to sort of capture all that has happened. Yeah. And it started in October and here we are in September, 2020, mm-hmm. and the story mm-hmm. keeps evolving. Gosh, yes. You know, it's it, it it's struck me. Big September, yeah. Yeah, yesterday I did an episode with uh, with Dalal Mawad, uh, and we both oh, sort of yeah. we sort of stu- we're like, oh, it's it's almost a year since the protest started, but but what a year! <laughs> I mean, I was thinking exactly. Yeah. Funny you should say that. I was thinking exactly the same thing. I looked out, and I was like, oh, September, and I thought, yeah, oh my God, it's almost it's almost a yearly anniversary from seventeenth of October. It's it's amazing how time yeah. is flown by yeah and, and also a lot's happened, as you said. and also that i didn't realize it's been almost now well it's, it's a month and five days since the blast happened i mean it's everything's moving fast and a lot of things are happening it's almost on a daily basis now and and when we spoke last yeah. time um i was sort of uh we, we kind of covered terrain that i thought best to save it for later uh we were yeah. doing that uh, donations episode that i kind of did very quickly yeah. and both of you were very generous back then and international protection came up I'm like you know what let's save this for later yeah. and I'm glad I'm glad we kind of in, in a way it's time to, to perfection because uh, the international story is now back and it's not something I think we should shy away from maybe in the days after the blast it was sort of uh, maybe the focus should have been 
rightfully so on the on the victims and, and the tragedy itself. Mm -hmm. But now there's a there's a developing story. But before yeah. we get into that, I should also acknowledge that uh, one of us is having a good time, and uh, the other two are stuck in our, <laughs> our similar situation. And Nadim, thank you for bringing that cricket with you from the uh, from the Greek shore, if I'm not mistaken, near Athens somewhere. You're currently in Greece having a good time. <laughs> I envy you. Thank you. <laughs> I think all three of us should be with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we record the podcast from the beach next time. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. Nadim, thank you for teasing us before we started recording that. Could you hear the waves? No, we can't hear the waves. <laughs> the next time we'll hear the waves. You know, I, um, there's a few topics I'd like to explore. And if, if it's okay, let's start with the sanctions, since that's maybe most present. Um, I mean, it's, sanctions is not a new story in itself, but maybe the recent sort of uh, pressure on non-Hezbollah members Hezbollah allies, and that sort of, that focus on corruption and potentially more sanctions being issued, and I don't think these are the only two. Um, yeah. let, let's start there. And whether or not this is a sustainable uh, campaign against Lebanese officials or previous ministers uh, by the U.S., or if this is just a sort of uh, the swan song of the last sort of weeks of the Trump administration. I mean, I, I have a lot of hypotheticals here, but I'm, I'm curious what you see, whether or not this is a renewed commitment by the US, or if this is just a sideshow that will sort of uh, fade into the background. And in that, uh, how much differing opinion there is between the US administration and Macron and French policy, and just how much divergence there is on Hezbollah. So Nadine, let's start with you, and yeah. and please feel free to go as far back in time as you'd like, because this is why I speak to you. So the the earlier references, the better. I always appreciate your perspective. Well, I, I'm not very good on the contemporary. I read all these speculations about Macron wanting to play, you know, the big game with with, with the big guys, and you know, the, the little man playing the big game. But uh, I I think they're all. They're all speculations in in, 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 in a way. I mean, uh, I mean, he's he's definitely trying to uh, to look like he's he's he has a role, international role with Iran, with the United States, with Turkey, with Greece, with uh, giving instructions to Lebanese politicians. Uh, I'm not sure what the instructions are. I mean, I saw the paper. But uh, I'm not sure it's uh, what it really amount, amounts to. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if he's if he's seriously recommending a government of national unity and consensus, mm -hmm. then I think it's a huge mistake. You know, I'm glad because I'm glad we're starting there. And I should I just interrupt you a bit, Nadim. Uh, yeah. You've made this point on several uh, different channels, and and recently uh, in terms of. Uh, just that, that a national unity government is the worst option right now. And I'm glad you're sort of starting Absolutely. there. Yeah. Can, can you expand yeah. on that? Why, why you think that what, what seems to be Macron's approach is probably the worst approach at, at this stage? Well, first, I'm not sure it's his, it's his approach. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not mm -hmm. sure this is what he means, but this is how it's being interpreted mm -hmm. also in, 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 in Lebanon. So a, a national unity government means that everybody is part of the same government, which means that you have the conflicting visions sitting at the same table. It's like having Trump and Bernie Saunders on the same, on the same, uh, in the same admin administration. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, so, so uh, basically, they will, they, uh, nothing will be achieved. They will block each other. It creates total paralysis. Uh, it creates, uh, in, in a way, limbo in, in all the uh, reforms and advancements and, <clears throat> and even in the appointments. And, and in the end, it, crea it, they, they, it creates a culture of compromise and, uh, and corruption. In a, on, 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 mm. on the, so so, so I, 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 I think that the problem in Lebanon is not, I mean, the bomb, if you like, the bomb, this blast 
is not the result of of cor cor corruption and and negligence. It's the result of a system that's been paralyzed for the last 12 years, that's been under siege, and that's become rotten from the inside. That that's that's what what I what I what I what, what I think is it. So when people say, "Oh, it's the corrupt uh, ruling class and negligence from uh, uh, you know." Um, Un unconscious uh, people. I, it's too easy a, 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 a definition uh, on on. Um, so so if if I mean you've lived through the last the last twelve years. I mean we've lived through assassinations. We've lived through two very long periods of not having a government, not having a president, not having a prime minister, and not having ele elections. It was nineteen months in. 2006, 2008, and then 29 months before the election of, of uh, <clears throat> before the election of uh, uh, of Aoun, and uh, each period of paralysis was followed by a compromise, which meant an encroaching an encroaching power of uh, of Hezbollah, basically, they 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 paralyze with their allies. They paralyze, they get a compromise, then they paralyze again. They get more compromise until, in the end, they they I mean, with with Aoun, especially if you combine the Doha compromises with the presidency of of, of Aoun, they have complete control of of, of the government. So national, okay. national unity is really just going back to the abnormal situation prior to October 17. Na national unity means there is no accountability. Right, yeah. There is no opposition. There is no responsibility because each party will accuse the other. They didn't let me, you know. Uh, and and uh, there's no accountability in the elections because uh, n nobody's responsible. So if you have a government... So the Diab government, if you like, was a was an accountable government uh, because it was a government of one side. Uh, it was a government which was orange, yellow, pistachio, and uh, green. Was it? it was so so uh, that side. It was solidly of that side. Yeah, I see. So that side, that side is accountable for successes, accountable for failures, and an election would have, would have, would have, if the other side had been responsible enough to produce an opposition, which they didn't, because of the paralysis, basically. In terms of accountability, that you can hold a certain team more, uh, they're, they're more accountable because there's no forced consensus and, and forced sort of limbo state compromise that's unhealthy but in just in terms of the sanctions and and focusing in on on whether or not this is sort of a is, is there a re renewed campaign here do you do you sense by the americans let's put macron to the side that the, that the uh, u.s administration is keen on seeing some form of long-term uh punishment towards individuals in the lebanese system or or do you see this as more just um this is just a temporary okay. measure yeah. Uh, um, what's interesting about the sanctions is that they were more about corruption than about terrorism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, 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 so it robs them from playing heroes that we are being sanctioned because because of our because we are the resistance and because we are right. So and and expose the the corruption on on that that's that's uh, I think it's being very carefully uh, uh, calibra calibrated uh, because of that yeah okay and sorry drew I, I'll let you go I just wanted to touch on a couple of points that uh, Nadim said that are very interesting for me <clears throat> and starting with your line of questioning national unity we know in the Lebanese context what national unity means or when national unity governments have been previously offered as the solution, it has been because there's been a, a discrepancy between sects or conventions on the street. Therefore, what we need is a national unity government because we're afraid that after 2008, we've seen clashes yeah. on the street, which has seen incredible amounts of discord. 
which is interesting that the fact that a national unity government is being <laughs> suggested is that there isn't that discord on the street. A national unity government would actually mean the opposite of what it has previously meant in the Lebanese context. A government not made up of the same sect or confessional leaders who are only by their good graces coming to into a government with their opposition because they don't want sectarian war in Lebanon, but actually a national unity government is what protesters and activists and all of us who are wanting accountability um, to strive for, which is a government actually competent and empowered to create reforms and accountability throughout the state system. It's kind of like downloading Windows 95 whenever you need an iOS uh, software update <laughs> and you're using the old mechanism to try and continue and replicate your power throughout the state. Now, unfortunately, the, what we see academically in terms of power sharing governments one of which I'm in now, um, Belgium and in other places, is that we see a lack of opposition, which is another point that Dean was saying, is the lack of opposition to hold governments to account. Because, and again, using a metaphor that we like to use in Lebanon, if everyone gets a share of the pie, it becomes very, very difficult to give up that said share. However, whenever you see successive governments who have used the horse trading and bartering to establish particular portfolios of ministries, as we see the finance ministry and other ones, um, it, is, it allows those groups to embed their actors. So again, I think that Nadim was right in the fact that we say there's been a shorthand for people saying, oh, it's the system or, oh, it's this particular issue, um, without actually accurately painting the full picture of why this system has become corrupted from the inside out. Because successive governments of national unity that have come about or risen up in response to discord, most oftentimes sowed by those particular leaders, has allowed them to replicate their own positions in executive governments and then to embed clientelistic networks throughout each ministry in which they've occupied successively mm -hmm. over the different years. So, yeah, um, I just wanted to jump in and, and just, uh, and just yeah. make that point. Well, there, there, is, there is a little bit more than that, because you don't have just successive governments of national unity. You have succession governments of national unity where one side has the, the uh, veto power, so the, para, the paralyzing power, yeah. which, is what they got, which is what they got on Doha. And exactly. the, other, yeah. the <clears throat> other factor is that, in case you haven't noticed, Lebanon is no longer sectarian in the sense that Lebanon is not divided along sectarian lines. Lebanon is right. divided along po very political lines. Sectarianism doesn't matter anymore, and you can see it on the street. People are saying we don't want sectarianism because they feel that, they, they're not, that, that, that there's no longer sectarian. But in 2005, people split, or if you like, the cars were shuffled in a totally different way f from during the civil war so the, the during and 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 every community split between pro and anti and anti syrian um, even though it doesn't look like it in uh, among the the shias if, if, if you like because of but that's also because of uh, the the electoral pact between 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 amal and hezbollah where they form uh, impenetrable uh, lists, so they always get 95% of, of the vote. It's like Assad getting 97.6% of, 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 of the vote so, <laughs> every time. It doesn't mean that 96.7% of the people in Syria are, are pro-Assad. It's the way the elections are rigged. So, 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 so whereas in, uh, whereas, but Lebanon has become much more di divided along that line, along that divide, pro and anti Hezbollah, pro and anti Syrian, pro uh, pro Hariri, with the vision of Hariri, if you like, more or less. Uh, the enemies of 1976 are the biggest allies of post post 2005, and it and it's not sectarian. So, uh, and and. Uh, and, and people argue within one family. <laughs> and I, th I think going back to that point, Ronnie, actually you started by uh, saying what, what to do with the sanctions. I think that the sanctions reflect this newer reality in Lebanon. Um, the, the sanctions, and spe specifically who they currently target, 
reflect um, this reality of, of the street rejecting the sectarian um, discourse mm. that has mm. been peddled by the leadership. Um, that that corruption, as Nadim said again, the corruption rather than terrorism is the main cause for these sanctions. And I think that that is a direct result of post... I mean, the situation for the country hasn't changed in terms of the economic outlook, how we've gotten into this situation, but what has changed has been the massive explosion in, in Beirut, Port, right. which has really been significantly a game changer in terms of how outside states should respond to um, to the Lebanese, to, to particular Lebanese political entities. Yes. I mean, these, these sanctions would have been easily just as relevant four months ago or in October 2017, or uh, October 17, as they are right now. But what has precipitated the impl implementation of the sanction has been uh, August 4. Do you see any real differing policy here in terms of the American approach and the French approach? That the Americans are more inclined to pursue this path and the French are maybe less inclined? And you, you hear this sort of in the background that the French are almost, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say doing Iran's bidding, but uh, they're, they're shielding Hezbollah from, from the story, where, while the Americans mm -hmm. are more openly pursuing that issue vis-a-vis -vis weapons, but also corruption. Mm -hmm. And it is important mm -hmm. to note that the, uh, I mean, the other names that eventually will come out will not be Hezbollah members. I mean, these are sort of right. non-Hezbollah. Or allies. Or, or allies, mm -hmm. but that the focus mm -hmm. may well be on, on corruption. And uh, these are from mm -hmm. quotes from David Schenker and, and the like. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah. Do, do you see a real fundamental rift here? And and is there real utility in terms of the sanctions right now, in terms of bringing some change uh, to Lebanon? It's two very important questions. Uh, certainly, especially as we're coming up to a U.S. election, how it looks at the end of November versus how it looks now is going to shift. I think that Macron is taking his lead, and certainly he seems to be the one I feel. This is purely based on conjecture and some of the, the sources that you cite. Mm of which there's the background talk, talk that Macron wanted a more deep ranging set of sanctions for a range of different actors across Lebanon. Obviously that hasn't come out yet. Um, maybe in the coming days that's going to be the case. Sorry, Whether or not, is that Macron or, or the Americans? That yeah, oh, well, I mean, oh, so the Americans imp uh, imposing sanctions for a range of actors, as right, you said, right, who are sorry, not. Right, right, yes, yes, yes. But, mm -hmm. uh, but Macron, yeah. by Macron's suggestion that, you know, we've heard names and rumors that Hariri is right. going to be involved. Yeah. Um, and I think that this is clearly, uh, my guess is that as we saw in the aftermath of the explosion, we saw Macron white riding in on his, on his white, Course, and he played the hero, and he, for once in his his political career, he seemed to have very good timing and an appeal to the common mass pop, popular okay. populace, which is not has not traditionally been his strong suit. Mm -hmm. but only, However, only in Lebanon, but not in not in France. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's been the complete opposite. Um, so my guess is is that his suggestion that we have see deeper sanctions, maybe something akin to almost a Caesar for Lebanon, for Lebanese actors, a Caesar mm -hmm. act for mm -hmm. Lebanese actors, is much more uh, in line with the populist thinking of the Lebanese street right now. Mm. Especially when I'm trying to piece together, when I'm looking at the video of him in, um, in Babda, and he's, he's talking down to the, each of the Lebanese politicians, and he's, he's, it's Lebanon's under the tutelage of, of France again. There's a role that he's playing here that's wider than the, the sanctions, which is establishing France as a key political actor in the region again. And Lebanon is an easy win, and applying sanctions across the board to deeply unpopular to a deeply unpopular political class is a step in one. You know, I'll pose this question to both of you, and let's start with, uh, with Nadim. Um, the the sim symbolic sort of gesture, if you will, that Macron is walking down Guru Street in Jemaisi. I mean, it's it's almost yeah. too good to be true. And then here he is, he's sort of away with no no politicians. It's him, he himself alone marching with the, the crowds, hugging him, and he's being very, um, he's good at those antics, he's very good and uh, well received. And then you have that sort of what Drew was uh, mentioning earlier that there is a, f a maybe a, a renewed French curiosity on, on the future of Lebanon. Mm. Is, is there anything there in terms of helping Lebanon right now that could really help the situation? Because I, I don't, 
I don't really understand what the French can actually do in terms of the real mm. tools that they can use in delivering what they see right. as necessary change and what lines up to most protester demands just in terms of reform and accountability and, and the issues that are there in terms of corruption, even though you rightly said earlier that maybe this, the, 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 the issue is not necessarily corruption alone, that there's sort of many components to the story. But, but what, what can the French really do in terms of uh, navigating uh, the ship right now? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at this ge geopolitics stuff, uh, you know, but, uh, but what's really obvious is that <laughs> this a is, lot of that's actors, the disclaimer before the answer shows up. I love yeah. that. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I mean, what, what's, what's obvious is that a lot of people are, a lot of actors are trying to fill the vacuum mm, mm. that the United States has left and that yeah. the United States is expected to, to leave. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, especially if we have Joe Biden as as uh, as president, uh, if our next president, so people are anticipating what will happen in 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 the elections. That's that that that's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. But Macron walking down the street, um, or Macron coming on the first of September, is very natural because it's a centenary of France declaring. Uh, right. The state of of uh, of greater of greater Le Lebanon. Yes, yes. So it's very legitimate for for France to be. What's that noise? That's my cricket chirping on the street every yeah. uh, every thirty minutes. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Ambulances just all over the place. Obviously. Yeah. So so um, I I I don't see it as abnormal for for. Uh, on the contrary, this is the main game changer now. Mm. Basically, what what I think is happening is that Lebanon has been hijacked by Hezbollah gradually uh, through this system of uh, this process of paralysis after paralysis after paralysis, emptying the, the the state from its content, emptying politics from its content, and don't forget also. A series of assassinations that kept everybody uh, in paralysis almost. I mean, we spent six, seven years, every phone call would be another assassination. So, mm -hmm. and fear, and, and so we have been terrorized by an organization. That's, I think this should be made very clear. And this organization is very comfortable in a Gaza style environment. So it almost created Gaza in Lebanon in 2006, and now we are very close to, be, to becoming another to becoming another Gaza. And you have Smail Haniya coming to visit Nasrallah yesterday to celebrate the fact that they have been successful in transforming Lebanon into an environment where only they can thrive, because in an environment like that, which is Poverty, siege, sanctions, constant war, constant uh, uh, suppression of, of people. Uh, everybody will leave except those that, that can be kept un under control. And, and because they don't need the financial system, they, 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 they have a lot of dollars to launder. They will, they will reign king. So, so this is the biggest danger that there is now of Lebanon being hijacked. That, that's my, that's my, my view. And it's very symbolic that at a time like this, you have France and the United States and all the Western powers descending on, 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 on Beirut because this is what I meant by international protection. Just, Drew, if, if I can ask you the... Uh just in terms of the the tools the available mm -hmm. and and well also but also echoing what nadim said is that yes the centennial mm -hmm. the french president is marching mm -hmm. down the street mm -hmm. it's a very mm -hmm. important occasion and the french are flying their jets on our centennial not our jets right and there's a lot of right. french involvement but well, they don't work they, right but it seems and from <laughs> my eyes it seems on a at best superficial level and and even right. though some some of those things are important I mean, it's great to see Feirouz and what her living room looks like, mm -hmm. but that's not yeah. really uh, 
change in <laughs> policy. That's just bringing Fedus yeah. back to life for a moment. I, I don't know mm -hmm. what the French can actually do. And I, yeah, right. I'll let you. And if you can also maybe touch on the Hezbollah issue as well, because I think what Nadine was yeah. saying was uh, is very relevant, just in terms of where Hezbollah is, where Hezbollah is today, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, France and the U.S. Well, exactly. I think that it, it touches on the fact that I don't think that uh, that France has the leverage in Lebanon. To we've seen, we've all looked at the timeline, the French timeline, which anyone who is a cursory understanding of Lebanese politics understands that a government is not most likely, and I would bet quite a lot of my savings, is not going to be formed in the next 15 days, um, that we are not going to have an, um, an international agreement with the IMF mm. inside the timeline, that we're not going to have systems of accountability as marginal as they are in the French timeline um, established, established to it, and we're probably not going to have elections within that timeline either. So at what point does, what leverage do we anticipate that Macron is trying to have? I think that you've already mentioned it in the fact that it's a political message, that mm. he is struck when the iron has, has been hot, at its hottest. Mm -hmm. And it's most likely its hottest in the immediate aftermath of the, of the, of the August 4th explosion. Hoping that this popular wave, my, this is my anticipation, that the popular wave of discontent at the current political leadership has allowed him to come in and effectively play the role of the international community. I would push back slightly on the, the, the international community has not descended on Beirut. Macron has descended upon Beirut. Um, the IMF had left the negotiations to, to Lebanon uh, some months ago, whenever we decided to play funny business with the, with the numbers of what our debt would look like. So Macron is the guy who's coming in and saying, okay, I understand that now the Lebanese elite the ones who control the levers of the system are at their weakest, at their most unpopular. And it is now at which point I can bring in and force them to, ex to concede on key requisites for reform within the system. So we can purchase, we can engage in a, in a bailout for the country economically. That's how I read it. Yeah. What leverage I think uh, going forward, and I think that Nadim already said it and you already mentioned it, is that Hezbollah, uh, who controls most of the, who is the most powerful political actor in the state, controlling most of the entity of the state, um, such as it is, such as as Nadim said, robbed of its um, of its relevance and meaning, is able to operate in crisis regardless. Is not beholden to an international bailout. Yeah. Is not in need, in particularly, to function with an international bailout. So, if the most powerful actor on the ground is not um, is not requiring the 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 large economic carrot that is being held over the Lebanese politicians, yeah. which every other actor in the country needs. Then, what are the chances that they can be brought to the table and forced mm -hmm. to accept some of these international prerequisites? I don't see, like you, I'm very skeptical of the leverage that Macron can bring in this situation. Is is that leverage that the Americans can apply, even if it's behind the scenes? And I mean, whether it's the sanctions only or, or other sort of other moves by the Americans. With the sanctions at the moment, it seems like, okay, well, we'll hit, hit key allies in the pockets. So if the country continues to economically disintegrate, these particular actors won't be able to free up their foreign assets and be able to leave uh, the country and enjoy their, or certainly bring in money so they can enjoy their island of paradise within Lebanon while the yeah. rest of the country is crumbling around it. However, I feel that that isn't anywhere near systemic enough to mm -hmm, really mm -hmm. grapple with the problems that Lebanon faces currently. Mm -hmm. um, as for what they could do, it's not my area of expertise, but you certainly could see maybe a deeper ranging set of sanctions on the, on the whole political class, perhaps maybe that might, um, that might necessitate a real coming to the table. But at the same time, you still have... You still have the problem with Hezbollah, who's still able to operate in these functions. And I didn't think of it until uh, until the team mentioned it, but yeah, that's certainly how I think the situation is most clearly uh, playing out on the ground as it is. And I'll ask you, Nadim, and this is just speculation. Maybe I, I'd like your opinion on this. That do you sense that there's a there's a differing of opinion within the U.S. administration on how to approach the Lebanese issue? Because it seems rather odd that so somebody like Gibran Bessir who's sort of now 
perhaps going to be on a list hasn't been on any list before. Or, or for that matter, that the Americans have been very slow to addressing this issue. And it seems like Hezbollah to them has not, is no longer the issue that it once was, regardless of administration. I, I, I just trying to maybe pick your brain on, on where America is right now. Not every crisis is reversible. That's the other thing. People are talking about the solution. Mm, mm. There are situations which are totally irreversible. And we could be in a totally irreversible situation. If Beirut is no longer a place which is an open city with an open society where there is freedom, it can disappear. Lebanon represents a vision which is in tune with what the old Levant uh, sees as the ideal type of society. It's not nationalist, it's free, it's minimal government, um, it's, it's more like the Riviera, if you, if you like. That's, that's the, the mm. and, and you had in the, in the, I mean, you had all the talents of, 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 of the region. I mean, you, I can, if you mention any institution in Lebanon, I can tell you who built it and who constructed it and where they came from, whether they came from Aleppo or from Homs. Yeah. I mean, the banking sector, Homsies and Aleppans and the financial expertise of people who came from Alexandria and Cairo. Let's say that trend is happening. Is there anything that could reverse that trend beyond Lebanon's borders today? It could even be trying to secure an IMF negotiation. It could be well, sanctions. It could be Macron's uh, ideas. Is there anything there? Right. I'm going to just quick, quickly yeah. back a question back at you to jump, to jump off. <laughs> what do you see the biggest problem with Lebanon right now? It's to, to me, right, single problem, right off the top of your head. I mean, I, I will say this until I die. I think Hezbollah is the reason mm -hmm. why Lebanon is in its current impasse. That does not negate right. every other problem that exists in Lebanon. Sure. But I think the sure. burden goes on them in terms of okay. where we are right now. I, I sense okay. that group mm -hmm. has delivered us what the Syrians couldn't, which is the okay. complete subjugation of the Lebanese state. Okay. And if... That's a magic wand. So if we could wave a magic wand and they could disappear, um, that that might be helpful, right? Well, it, However, it, it, it would at problem? least. It would, oh no! It, it would. It, it would let sorry, us. Sorry, the point. I'm, yeah, no. It would, yeah. it would let us focus on the issues that really matter, okay. and and we can't right. get there because of one group's capabilities. But sorry, yeah, right. Yeah. But yes, so I agree with that entirely. But the problem I see going forward is that in what future can any viable activist young politician, secular or otherwise, coming up in Lebanon, what at what part does the Lebanese state offer anything to the uh, the people already living there? It offers the almost no one's the state you know, the state, sorry, no, what what can Lebanon living in Lebanon, the experience of living in Lebanon, what does it offer any any Lebanese right now? I mean, uh, very little, hmm. if anything. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so previously, my my worry is that we see, a, obviously, Lebanon has always had a brain drain. Always. It's it's a country of net outward migration. No, the, no, the, no. Generally, it was, yeah. No. We've, we've Lebanon, seen successive civil Lebanon. wars. We've seen lo locust hordes. We've seen yeah. significant brain drains throughout Lebanon. Yeah. We've, ha we've had, a, a, we've grown a very strong diaspora. Okay, that has crucially underpinned through remittances the ec economic system, largely upheld the economic system, right? Or it's certainly been, played a significant part in the in upholding the economic system. We've also had a higher education system that has been effectively the best in the region, that has continually um, produced international class um, students in across a range of disciplines. If the education system does completely collapse, and we do see a state that isn't able to offer any kind of viable economic or social mobility future for any of its citizens, and we continue to see a brain drain, and I agree, there has been times where it hasn't been a complete brain drain, but 
And the point I'm making is that we see a brain drain from Lebanon going forward, unlike, quite frankly, any that we've seen previously before. My worry, and this is pure, just something that I've played with in my head, is that we then leave the state to those who have already captured it, including Hezbollah including all the different actors who have already established their clientelistic network throughout the state. And there's no one left to challenge it. There's no one able to challenge it within the state. So going forward, um, it doesn't paint a very pretty picture in terms of what can, what can, we, what can be rescued. Um, that's a question far beyond my expertise and, and, and intellect, but I think that it's systemic across a number of different factors. We need a bailout. We definitely need international bailout. That's for one. Um, and we need to start um, setting up a system of accountability. And quite frankly, elections as soon as possible, while the, our politicians, the embedded politicians, are at their lowest, their lowest uh, popular ebb. Maybe we start to... Um, get get to some some of the institutions nadim i sense there may be some disagreement there but I, i'd like you always. to always always but let me tell you i mean what 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 what, what Drew has given us is is in a way true in the sense it is the true perception lebanon is not a country that has brain drain. Lebanon is a country that has benefited from the brain drain of other places. The, the, the phenomenon of immigration is a universal phenomenon in the Mediterranean and in Eastern Europe. I mean, uh, the Poles, the Hungarians, the Slavs, they go, go, go anywhere and you'll, you'll find uh, Italian communities and Greek communities and and the difference is that Lebanon has been able to attract them back. They didn't go and totally forget about because the, the key is whether you have a society or a state that provides you with, the, with freedom and with protection for your property and, and, your, and where, you can, where you can live in relative uh, Relative freedom, basically. That's the key. I think that's the key. The key issue. If there was no freedom in Lebanon, if there was no state that could provide this, then no, no, no elite from the region would have come here, and no immigrants would have come back. And you have a lot, a lot of return migration to 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 Lebanon from people who went to. Um, to Brazil, to Latin America, to Australia, to other places, be because the country could receive them again and provide them with uh, with with a, with a good life. Uh, uh, I don't know how many Hungarians went back to Hungary, uh, or, I mean, but but brain drain. I mean, not brain drain. Movement of population is a constant. Sometimes it's a loss, sometimes it's a benefit. There are some people I'd like them to emigrate, I believe me. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but but but, but it is it is usually a net gain. I mean we gained from the Palestinians, we gained from lots of Syrians, we gained from Iraqis, from Egyptians, from and, and it's because of the environment. It's, so to revive Lebanon, you need to revive a political system. Now the political system is completely paralyzed. Drew, I, I, I'm glad that before we started recording, you mentioned something. Your laptop, I believe, is sitting on a house of many mansions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, currently. Okay, so right. let, let's go with that. And I, I'd like to pick up where, where Nadim left off. The answers that seem to be both... Um, I'm not going to speak on Nadim's behalf, but just sort of echoing the sentiment of that Lebanon's model is something worth celebrating. And that the secularism that... that that the secularism that entered the Middle East in the 20th century was not healthy, and that's sort of, I'm, I'm glossing over here, and that uh, right. the domestic capabilities of the Lebanese are there so long as things line up better for Lebanon. And I, I want to just right. pick your brain on that. What Nadim is saying as somebody who's cautious maybe about the aspirations of some protesters 
And then what you saw in, in, in your sort of analysis on Lebanon and what, where you think things should move. And this is maybe stepping a bit away from international protection. And let's sort of, with, with the inability to secure an IMF bailout, maybe yeah. with the acknowledgement that international players Iran aside and its involvement aside, mm -hmm. are unable to sort of really steer the ship. Mm -hmm. I mean, does any of that resonate with you? And the, and that the, the formula, the Lebanese formula, is is old, and it should uh, it should stay. Okay, so I'm I'll, I'll start with the philosophical point since you you mentioned House of Many Mansions and and and. Um, the fact is, is we see cleavages open up within secular democracies that are not necessarily along set lines. Um, we see the difficulty of struggling with historical pasts in well-established liberal democracies. We only need to point at the, the issues of race today that emerged within very, very prominently in the US and the UK, and a reimagining or a retake, or not a reimagining, a reversioning, not even a reversioning, a, an, an acceptable um, amount of protest directed to trying to actually equalize the record of what some of these Zions of the state had actually participated in, mm, things mm. like slavery. So we're always in contention, right? Even in secular states. And this is where I certainly would agree in the fact that my topic matter looking at consociations in a comparative sense, consociational democracies, power sharing democracies, confessionalism, power sharing in the Northern Irish accent, however you want to define it. Or off and I would consider myself a, a critical defender of the system, is that they're often labeled as something that is arcane, something that is based on immutable identities. But that's not all that's not they don't operate in unison in exactly the same way that Lebanon does. My problem with the Lebanese system, and I think that there sometimes can be a misdiagnosis, and, and if I want to take, I want to compare whenever I did my PhD research in 2009 and 2010 to doing recent power sharing research in Lebanon in 2018 and 2019, mm. I think that in 2009, 2010, there was a very, very um, clear um, outward expression that the system, confessionalism is the problem. We need secularism. We need a government in opposition. We need to leave behind um, identity and in the political realm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However, what I saw in 2018, 2019 was, and I don't think that this is, this is purely anecdotal, and please I'm not su suggesting that this is the, the, the main shift, is that there was a better diagnosis or a deeper diagnosis of what problems were affecting Lebanon, mm -hmm. which was we appreciate that everyone can have an identity because, as we've just been discussing, that is the Lebanese project, yeah. a small area in the Levant that happened to create a social mosaic through successive inward migration of people seeking protection from secular government, secularization in other places, and Ottoman uh, imposition at other times. Mm -hmm. That's happened to create quite an interesting cauldron of different groups and different perspectives. That is, for me, is Lebanon's strength. It's a land of refuge, and of course, that's why we mention House of Many Mansions and the different perspectives on the, on the state. However, and coming to the point that you're making is that, and coming into my research field, is that Lebanon's state has ceased to exist because it has become captured by a small cadre of political elites that have used their weaponized sectarianism as a means of different and difference and replicating their own power. That does not mean that we should automatically all become um, secularists the next day. That is not the root cause of the issue. The root cause of the issue is the state has been hijacked. The, uh, the functions of the state have been hijacked. Mm. In Northern Ireland, for example, where we employ a power sharing system, there is some elements of clientelism that have crept in. But what we have is also very strong accountability mechanisms within the state function as well. Right. And not only we talk about accountability, but also... I think that there is an important element of censure. Censure for our political class is more important than accountability because, again, as Nadine pointed out, corruption is everywhere. I mean, it's uh, it's not a, a phenomena. And as Lebanese, we can become quite inward looking and say, oh, we're the most corrupt or what? We're not. Simply there we're is corruption. Above. Or 
of the best. Yeah, we're, exactly. We're always center of the universe, the best winemakers, the best everything. Yes, but <laughs> I, I mean, even comparing it to other states that I've worked in power sharing, like Burundi, it's Lebanon's corruption is not as deeply systemic as, uh, as Burundi, for example. However, what we have is censure for politicians in power sharing systems that work more efficiently, like Belgium, than Lebanon. But we don't have censure right now because we have a strong political actor that we've mentioned that is deeply embedded in the state and is able to make decisions without or <laughs> the the without other other communities or other community leaders it creates a system consistent of power, power so let me consistently powerized and without and that's the important thing is that we don't we're unable to then vote them out or we're unable to limit their ability because the state has been so captured. You know, I'll ask both of you this question. Let me start with Drew, though, because I, I want to pick up there. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll keep this very broad, and you can say what you want. Uh, the, is there anything in terms of international involvement at this point that can help break that paralysis? And, and you take it wh whichever direction you want. This is not necessarily just Hezbollah, but that you can see a way for the outside actors to help break the paralysis, which you're both, which you're both describing, which is the state of affairs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was meant for Drew, but I think uh, Drew, I like that. I like the, yeah. <laughs> thanks. No, come on. Thanks, Ronnie. Uh, well, I think that we've mentioned, I mean, the immediate, my immediate concern is that we do, for lack of, suffer a devastating outward migration because the state doesn't offer anything to any citizen in Lebanon. Despite the fact that even if it doesn't offer anything to Lebanon, a lot of people will still find it very difficult to move. Mm -hmm. My my worry is that we lose a lot of our key our key our key uh, actors on the ground or our key Le like Lebanese generation who we would like to see moving into position. So that's more of a long term sort of mm -hmm. issue that I have that can be affected right now. So I look to see the a stabilization of the economy. However, that stabilization of the economy should not be a further embedding of the current political class, which I'm very worried that we, the international community, will accept economic stability in Lebanon at the cost of some systemic reforms in, and investigations into corruption and accountability measures. So it sounds, so it I, sounds I like, a, like a slightly more positive version of 1990, where there is a tolerance right. for the new status quo and that it doesn't really help Lebanon rebuild the way it should. Right, yeah. exactly. And I suppose that more positive spin is the fact that we're not at, like exiting a devastating civil war in which the communities were right. completely polarized. And the reason why it's positive now yes. is that at least we've seen a coalescence of the communities on the ground. Right, right, right. And that is an important distinction. And that's something that at least helps me get three hours of sleep at night and realizing that we have that that small but important difference, whether or not we can carry it on into political action by starting to recapture the state mm. and to make it more efficient and to reduce the overburdening of the client listing networks that have expanded it and mm. Mm. key actors that are operating within it. That's, that's the next step. And Nadine, can I, I mean, do you, do you share that sentiment that international involvement at this point furthers paralysis rather than breaking it? Well, no, maybe, I think maybe. <laughs> I, I think I, I I see international involvement in the very Ottoman uh, background sense that inter it, it is protection. <laughs> it is protection. Right. It, right. It, yes. it, you know, they, they basically in uh, in eighteen sixty international involvement came and helped and showed protection. Mm -hmm. In nineteen fifty eight, international involvement showed protection. In nineteen eighty three. The multinational forces after the Israeli invasion and Sabra and Shatila and the, the, the collapse of uh, everything <coughs> came and showed uh, <coughs> basically they, uh, to show uh, protection. It was a form of, uh, yeah. of protection. Yeah. <coughs> and now it's, it's in, 19, uh, in 2004, after the, the, uh, before the Hariri assassination, in 2004, it started actually with a meeting between George Bush and and uh, uh, Jacques Chirac, where Jacques Chirac was uh, telling George Bush that you know we can mend mend our uh, differences over Iraq, 
uh, your proper, your thing, this democracy thing that you have. Maybe it's a good idea, but why not in Lebanon too? You've given Lebanon as a bakhshish to the Syrians in uh, 1990. Let's get Lebanon back into into democracy. Why only Iraq? Yeah. So, so there you have 1559, and and uh, Lebanon under international protection through French, American, British, uh, Western, uh, Unite, and the United Nations involvement and. The whole world came back mm, mm. in support of the protect, protecting that, that little entity. Now, this is not to say that Lebanon is a disabled country that can only live through protection. Any small country like that uh, has a choice. You either become a fascist entity or you, you I mean, you know, if, if you want to, to build, a, to protect yourself, Look at Kuwait, yeah? If Kuwait wants to protect itself from Iran and Iraq at the same time, if it has to build an army strong enough to, to, to uh, protect itself from, from, from both, it, it, it would be a totally different country, and I don't think it can even do it. It, it, would, be, it would have to spend all its oil, all its oil money on, on, uh, on, on creating the army and arms. And and it it would be a different type of society. It would be uh, Kuwait enjoys American protection. When the American ambassador in Kuwait in Iraq blinked, and Saddam interpreted it as as a hesitation, Kuwait disappeared three days afterwards. You see, that's so so protection is a. You, 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 can, you can protect yourself through treaties, through allies, by diplomacy, by... You don't have to have a, an army to protect, you, to protect yourself for, right. uh, uh, always. Now, the other thing is the IMF. The IMF won't resolve anything. The IMF, for me, symbolizes an international involvement. But IMF bureaucrats will be contented with a... Pan, with a with a little deal, you know, they give you a few billion and they, you, you give them a semblance of a cosmetic reform thing which you will never apply, and then it will fail. You know, uh, what you need to get Lebanon back on track is uh, to, to, to make sure that Lebanon gets protected again by the international community against the, 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 what Hezbollah is, is trying to do. Now, this is not also, there is another very dangerous uh, uh, proposition. We don't want the United States or France to come and give us victory against Hezbollah. This is not, no. right. this, this is not, the, the, we don't want the, 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 United, the, the, the West to come and get one, one uh, football uh, <laughs> uh, uh, club to win over over, over 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 another. We want the we want to regain the place where the game continues. Lebanon is a place which can incorporate contradictory ideas. Drew, I want to pick your brain on what Nadim said. That kind yeah. of uh, I mean, I'm trying to see if there's any with all the examples Nadim listed. Is there any uh, any hope at this point that you could sort of recreate a situation where uh, Lebanon does get that kind of protection so that the issues that Nadim addressed can sort of uh, reach a point where there's some harmony again among communities that differ and, and ideologies that differ too. Sometimes they're so starkly opposed to one another, yet they can live side by side. Yeah, and I think that in some of the examples that that uh, Nadim highlighted also highlight the weakness of the approach was that in a region like the Middle East, um, like the Levant, whenever we have different actors who operate within the local polity that are linked to the regional dynamics, sometimes whenever that external load or that those external rivalries become too great, it reflects inside inside the country, which is always a particular problem. Mm. So. In very, very many ways, this is the, this, the tale of Lebanon in the region, of course, is that 
it's not one of the key um, captains of the ship. It's uh, it usually goes along with the prevailing winds. Now that doesn't mean to say that I think that this can't be that the idea of Lebanese coexistence, which I think that is the the most important aspect of of the country as well and i would agree the fact that we have this diverse population and we have this di- group of diverse inter intersecting cultures is that <clears throat> is that whenever we have a state that okay so again that is able to make treaties as a state as a singular polity or as a polity that may have internal disagreements but no but then communities don't seek their own international protection mm. as I- individual communities. So again, it comes back to the, the fact that the state is not operating. The state is paralyzed. The state ceases to institute the service provision or its foreign policy that allows protection for all the citizens. So mm. under those circumstances, individual communities at the sub-state level have to seek their international protection themselves, which brings them more likely into conflict with a other right and then if those external loads become greater or those external regional geopolitical rivalries increase if you as a sub-state collective community have hitched your wagon to a particular actor who then comes into conflict with another yeah. community's actor you you're more likely to create um drew that's response. really really well said i don't think i've ever heard it sort of described in that way so that there are there is plenty of international protection in Lebanon. It's just not at the right. state level. <laughs> it's not where no, it should be. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but there is another caveat I want I want to say about the Lebanon about, about Lebanon, which is probably different. It's not so different from Ireland, but uh, Ireland is is very special. I've I've been to Belfast. <laughs> it's. Uh, um, and the solution is very is very different because mm-hmm. your solution in the the Good Friday Agreement is not a solution of principle. It's power sharing according to to power, so it's sensitive to demographic change. In Lebanon, the reason why we haven't had a census is not because we are afraid of blah blah blah. It's because, in principle, we want the country to be shared between those communities, and and size doesn't matter in in, in the, the size of the community. I mean, doesn't 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 matter. Lebanon will always be, I mean, the Druze will always have a place because of their historic uh, importance. The Armenians, the the uh, Maronites, the that's that's the principle. That it's not. How many? How many? Uh, it's not the demographics that determine that determine the. But the other thing is that generational changes. I mean, there was in my grandparents' generation, they the most important thing was nationalism. Uh, in uh, I mean, in our parents' generation, yeah. generation. In, yeah. my, in, in my in my in my generation, it was religion. In in uh, I mean in the in the next generation seems to be gender I don't understand it completely, <laughs> but but they are more exercised about gender than they would be about religion or nationalism. Yeah. You know, Nadim. So, so, so I, things change. There, things change. You you have a special and, and place. Gen- sorry, sorry. Go ahead, please, please go ahead. The new, the new generation in Lebanon is not exercised about religion or about sex. They, they are genuinely non-sectarian. The new generation. Yeah, that is true. And it's uh, they are they are because uh, their parents were sectarian. I mean, the, the split during the civil war and and people react against the, their parents, but they have to. But uh, this doesn't mean that they sh- the whole system should be re- rejected. The reason why sects can live together in Lebanon is precisely because. There, there was less tension between them through the power sharing system. On, on. You know, Nadim, I'm, before, we're going to wrap up with neutrality. I won't keep you guys much longer. I know I sort of, I've, yeah. I've overstayed my, uh, I, I've taken too much time. No. But I will say one thing, Nadim. Uh, you have yeah. a special place in my heart because I don't know anyone, anyone, anyone who can make me reassess my emotions towards things like sectarianism 
fears of revi revisiting the census. I never heard anyone describe the census as that sort of point of harmony that no one wants to go back to because it's like I've never heard anyone do that. And you found a way, you found a way to take the division from nationalism and religion to now the gender stuff that's gender, happening. Gender, yeah. <laughs> well done. I, 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 you're good. Seriously, you're really I, good. Maybe, maybe no, the I mean, next census will be about along gender lines, I think. Though. I mean, I certainly maybe, think maybe. that yeah. it's a very eloquent. I, I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't entirely go along with uh, the fact that, especially the differences between Lebanon and Northern Ireland, I think that there are demographic, dem fears over demographics manifest in different ways, but I definitely think that they're, they're certainly evident in both states. But sorry, yeah. sorry, Ronnie. No, no, I, I, no I'd like, you, I mean, oh, sorry, you, yes, if go if ahead. Look, if you look at, I mean, we're we are in the centenary of Lebanon, yeah? A mm -hmm. mm. hundred years ago, when, when Greater Lebanon was created, the Shias didn't want to join. They, mm -hmm. they they want they they uh, uh, they there there had a, there was a slogan which said Hikmet Turkey wala Hikmet Kirki. Yeah, yeah, The Sunnis want wanted to didn't want to join. Tripoli didn't want didn't want to join. The Orthodox didn't want to join. In the end, Lebanon has built a, a quite a cohesive national feel a sentiment in. In the hundred in a hundred years, gradually, mm. uh, without it being imposed through Bathy style, uh, wearing uniforms in schools and uh, singing hymns and, 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 all, and all that. If you look at the new generation, they are amazing. They're they're pretty yeah. nationalist. They're pretty cohesive. They're pretty non-sectarian. This is the success. You know what's yeah. what's striking? Sure, what's that's very important of the very, project. Very I mean, they are a proof. But I'll I'll just add to that. I'll, yeah. I'll and I, I I agree with everything you're saying about that. That, that the cosmopolitanism that you're describing is consistent. It hasn't dampened. If anything, it's expanded over the years. Even even despite all the sort of that we always talk about a bubble that's shrinking. But the fact is that bubble is still there, and that's something very special about that part of the world except that the environment has become so toxic that there's right. the, the breathing space is no longer there. You have that sort of the sentiment without the state. And that's, um, I think that's yeah. where the, that's where the tragedy yeah. is that these, these we have the nation, but we don't have the state. Yeah. yeah. So it's the same in Iraq, in Iraq, uh, mm. in, 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 in Iraq, they are now revolting against, the institutions of the revolution regards in Iraq against the militias of Iran in Iraq, which are the same as Hezbollah, which have totally hollowed the state from, from its from from from. So so in, in a way, we're not the only. We, we are suffering from a problem that is the same in in Gaza, the same in Syria, the same in. In, in, uh, in Lebanon, of course, and in Iraq and in Yemen. Uh, that, 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 yeah. So yeah. You, want, you want to go to... Well, what I'd, was it again? No, I'd like to wrap it up with just the, a, a, a brief discussion about neutrality. And I yeah. think, um, I mean, it, it sort of comes, it, it's re-entered. I mean, it's, it's always there in the background, but when the patriarch sort of brings it up, it kind of makes news headlines and then it kind of fades yeah. again to the background the babda declaration not too long ago it sort of resurfaced and then it went back sure. and then it's it's always there it's always in the discussion and that there's an there's always an attempt at some form of neutrality and then there's a very harsh reality that the state cannot be neutral and that this discussion goes further saying that no state can actually be neutral even a country like switzerland will have to deal with its neighbors in some way or another. But that's the best state, that's the best case scenario. Lebanon is on the complete opposite end. It's a country that yearns for something like that, but is in really the wrong neighborhood to achieve that. But right. I want to talk about neutrality. Yeah. Maybe let's, let's start from where we are right now and whether or not neutrality ever really existed in Lebanon. And we can go back, not we don't have to just talk about independent Lebanon. Go back earlier. I'm talking now in sort of modern Lebanese history. Was neutrality really sort of, did we ever have something that felt like it? Or is it even achievable today? Or is it just sort of uh, academic jargon that's tossed around and it sort of comes and goes? Even, even when, even when it's a presidential mm -hmm. decree or the patriarch is ruffling feathers 
by saying it, and maybe sort of Hezbollah is sort of very opposed to that kind of language. Drew, mm-hmm. can I start with you? Yeah. Just just uh, yeah. the, the broader discussion on neutrality. I, I, I think it's a very interesting discussion. And when small states survive by being quote unquote neutral, they have something to offer the larger states. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned mm-hmm. Switzerland is the classic example of a, of a neutral state. What mm-hmm. do they offer? Its neighbors, its economic and its banking system, its investment system, its ability to offer a service to the states around us, around it. In Lebanon, you know, was this often tried to describe itself as, uh, you know, the Switzerland of the Middle East because it drew a parallel to its banking system. Yeah. Okay. It was a large state for, for regional investment as well. No hot chocolate, no cuckoo clocks, and no one, commi- <laughs> no one committing suicide. We're killing each other. So it's clearly yeah. the opposite of Switzerland. <laughs> Don't know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but everyone is armed, so we have right, that. That's true, um, yeah. <laughs> and we can ski, but you can't uh, water ski in the same day in Switzerland. There you go. Unless you go into Lake Geneva on certain <laughs> times of the year. Um, <clears throat> so the wider, yeah, and, and a, I mean, long looking longitudinally at Lebanon's history again, and to the to to the point of the entire show of why we're talking is that when we look at outside actors have always played a part multiple outside actors have always played a part in, in the in lebanon's um political orientation mm-hmm. how can a state remain neutral as you said in a situation in which alliances alliances in the region and internationally are in flux they don't remain stable mm-hmm. and they don't remain stable long certainly over decades they don't remain stable over centuries and they don't remain stable in, in, in months, depending on whatever is happening in the region. When we see, I mean, effectively, for example, Lebanon's own civil war helped, the end of its civil war was helped because there was a regional flux. We had the Gulf War, and we had U.S. seeking an alliance and, and a blessing towards Syria that it could help impose its, uh, its vision for Lebanon, or its, its uh, political hegemony in Lebanon. So in terms of like this elusive search for neutrality, I, I think it's it's an oasis or it's a mirage, right? I mean, this is not something, I think it's something that is naturally emotionally um, understandable to reach for mm. because we live in a region that is um, geopolitically very, very important, okay, to large international powerful actors. And this is, again, I'll maybe compare Northern Ireland and Lebanon is that, and I mentioned this on the first appearance in your show, is that Lebanon is in a strategic hub. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's located in the Levant. It neighbors Syria and it neighbors Israel. And it's larger and it's those sub-community actors usually at, apply their allegiances to actors who are operating in their region in rivalry or in antagonistic relationships with other actors in the mm-hmm. region. Mm-hmm. Northern Ireland exists in a region where we have the Atlantic Ocean and the Irish Sea, and we have the UK, and we have um, and Ireland as our neighbours, who in 1985 agreed that they would largely not con- step on each other's toes yeah. over the direction of Northern Ireland. Right. right. So, whenever we s- the, the, how is neutrality even possible? Even when you look longitudinally at Lebanon's history under the Ottoman Empire, it hasn't been empirically um, evidenced in our history <laughs> any kind of neutrality or any kind of lack of conflict with other actors or at least um, a confluence of interests of outside actors playing out in Lebanon. That hasn't mm-hmm. been evident. There hasn't. So why can we assume that it is going forward? So I suppose I would bring myself into Dean's uh, point of view, which is going forward, is that that confluence of, of different actor interest in Lebanon is, you know, is probably a reality and not necessarily um, a weakness going forward. Interesting. Nadim, would you yeah. echo that sentiment that it's just uh, what, what Drew said? It's more of a mirage than uh, than anything of, uh, of substance at this point. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I agree. And, and Lebanon was never neutral. You can almost adjust your clock at when <laughs> to the times when Lebanon lost its protection. I mean, in, in, on the 1st of March, 1984, 
the, the multinational forces withdrew from Lebanon, and that was the end of protection. Mm. That, 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 and between 84 and, and, and 1990, you had the hostage crisis, you had the, the war of the camps, you, you had uh, Sunni Shia clashes, you had wars within each side. Mm -hmm. They were not sectarian wars, you yeah. had clashes in, uh, within, each, within each community, and, and it was basically about, I mean, even amongst the Palestinians, you had clashes. It was about yeah. Yeah. Syrian control. And, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the hostages were taken by sort of Syrian, Iranian type uh, uh, organizations that were created over, overnight. And they were released in Damascus, which got the Reagan administration gradually into thinking, ah, seems, it seems Syria, the Syrian Hafez al-Assad seems to be able to resolve all the problems of, of, of Lebanon because he's releasing our hostages. But of course, he was the one taking them in the first place. <laughs> so so w between March 1984 and the 5th of May, in the afternoon of the 5th of May, 2004, exactly 20 years, Lebanon was out of, out of the international scene and was left completely, uh, 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 Syria was given a complete free hand in it. So if you look at the, the, the last uh, years of what we call the civil war, it was uh, pro-Syrian factions controlling the Palestinian camps. It was fighting between two, two branches of the SSNP, two branches of the Communist Party, two branches of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Organization of Communist Action, uh, even two branches of the Morabitoun, <laughs> the Fatah branch versus the Syria branch. So, it was gradual Syrian, con and, and the Syrian army surrounded every single town in Lebanon, Zahle for three months, of uh, Zgharta, Ashrafiye, until they, they, they kind of uh, surrendered and, and, and made, a, made, made a deal. It was gradual Syrian takeover and gradual changing of the system in the 90s with the building of this monstrous army we have. Why do we need an army of 70,000 people? I mean, uh, it's 20% of our, uh, of our uh, budget. Uh, well, education, I think, is 33% or something like that. It's but but that's the, the, let's say the broader goal of trying to remove Lebanon from its regional environment and in terms of crisis and conflict so that the ripple effects don't reach Lebanon. And I, I mean, I... No. Let's let's not give remove you, you. I mean, you have you have um, international protection means that the 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 uh, powers in the region that are a, that are able to cause problems in Lebanon, like the Iranian Revolution Guard, like the Ba'ath Party, like whatever, 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 are told very clearly. Uh, this area here. Is off limits. Is off limits. Yeah, you just leave the Lebanese. That's that's what kept Lebanon uh, afloat and and free and okay. prosperous. But um, it I'm, was international protection. I'm curious, Nadim, when when did that situation actually happen in Lebanese history? I mean, when was the? Oh, 1860 was the first instance. Okay. Yeah. And if uh, there's a there's a lecture by uh, Philippe Taala, who was uh, our foreign minister for a very long time, in the 1950s, where he discusses uh, neutrality and he says Lebanon was never neutral. We mm. were mm. always protected by the West. Mm. We, we and and in fact, uh, before uh, World War Two, it was uh, the protection was. Fran Fran France and Britain. 
during World War II, the Lebanese elite sensed the change of international uh, balance of power, and that the United States was the new the new power on the on the scene, and they consciously sent an ambassador to the United States that would build the protection for Lebanon from from the United from the from the United States, and it was Charles Malik. Okay, so let's say there's there's these two sort of differing approaches. One is international protection, which Lebanon experienced in different stages, different to different degrees, and then neutrality, which is a, a byproduct, it's a consequence of a certain level of international protection, but that the two don't necessarily overlap all the time. Is there any situation where you can actually deliver enough protection where neutrality becomes the sort of the go-to policy within Lebanese circles. And I'm going to use an example here. Uh, let's say something like Austria in uh, post-World War II, Cold War Austria, yeah. that the Russians and the Americans sort of agree that Austria yeah. shall remain neutral. So that's, yeah. two, that's two things at once, that they're guaranteeing a domestic approach that will serve Austria's interests well. I think it's the name, yeah. it's the name of their constitution, it's the Treaty of Neutrality. So that's even their, that's their, that's their constitution, it's, it's, it's embedded. Uh, Finland also to a degree as well, a country that remains neutral, bordering the Soviet Union, and it's neutral throughout the Cold War. And maybe a bloodier example is, uh, is Bosnia, where the country sort of was forced to adopt a policy, perhaps Kosovo today now more than ever, but these are, these are, this is following international intervention. But it, are, mm -hmm. Are those absent from the Lebanese story altogether? That you can never have that kind of situation develop in Lebanon, where you would want to see something like those other countries surviving either some chaos or, or more, more chaos as a result of war, where Lebanon yeah. would be shielded to a degree. L let me start with you, Drew, on, on that note. So I think that regarding, at that point, you need an internationally brokered agree you mentioned an internationally brokered agreement that there's buy-in of the regional actors that there's some type of leverage from international actors to um, force acquiescence from the from the the regional players the main regional players like Saudi and Iran um, to agree that they do not play a more negative role in that right and I think that there are times where that has been, certainly I think that under the Obama regime that there was a, a consequence of trying to open up negotiations or open up the um, the Iranian deal, which was trying to bring in the the regime into the, from the cold. Obviously, the Trump administration has gone in a different direction, uh, for, for better or for worse, I'll leave it up to you to judge that. So you need the coalescence of both the local scene in which um, we have local actors who are um, engaged, hopefully in a in a some in a in a, in a fair polity, or a, at least have feel agency on a local polity. Do not try to seek outside actor influence to gain one upsmanship on the local scene as well. So but you need those two. Yeah, but is there any is there any sort of merit in let's say Macron was advised to hold a summit? Beyond mm. visiting Fairuz and beyond visiting Jamezi and Barabda, right. goes to he hosts a summit in in the what is it, what is it what is the name of Dorsey? Of course, I forget the name of the the French Foreign Ministry in France. Oh, oh, yeah. Dorsey, thank you, thank you. There's a grand summit for the uh, neutrality of Lebanon, and Iran is invited and asked, "What will you need to let go of Hezbollah's weapons?" <laughs> Almost like a, you know, let's end this story once and for all. You tell us what you need to let go of this sort of mm -hmm. larger than life <laughs> situation. Right. Is there anything there that that could protect Lebanon? Because I don't sense well, any yeah. any I don't sense any interest on the geopolitical no. level, on the international level, right. at even trying to do something like that. Rather, it's yes. accommodating Hezbollah. Or the American approach, which is hurting them at a, at a small, small level in right. ways that may yield some results later, 
but that's not really changing the situation necessarily. That's sort of just a, that's that's accommodating mm -hmm. the reality. I I, I don't right. know. Is there anything there? I mean, Lebanon would have to be a priority in the international community's um, yeah. policy list mm, 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 mm. for a start. For for something like that to happen, it would have to be a priority. Yeah. For the U.S., the priority is not Lebanon. Right. The priority is Iran. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, whatever concessions they can get from Iran, as long as it doesn't hurt their interests primarily in Iraq, then they're not going to they're not going to worry about what happens in, inside Lebanon. Right, right. So there's the, there's the opportunity for the, the for Lebanon itself leverage in this circumstance, and it is not even during the the Lebanese civil war. It you know whenever there was quite a lot of international interest, and there were these summits like Geneva, to to try and create peace. We didn't see um, you know those the, that situation for Lebanon is non-existent right now. And I don't see how it would, mm. you know, how that would change, how the direction of the international community would shift into really solidifying Lebanon's position. Nadim, do you share the same sentiment as Drew, that it's just, it's not there? There's no interest? Well, there's one thing common between Lebanon, Austria, and Switzerland, is, the, is that, in, in that the countries themselves wanted it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, it's not that people came and said, okay, we're going to spare Austria right. and, and make it neutral. And and in, in fact, Lebanon, well, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's is, did, did, wasn't it sort of a, a very strategic approach by the Americans and the Russians to just to make sure that that country was not on the battlefield. Well, they they could have. Uh, uh, I mean, there there was a a uh, if the Austrians didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, right. It wouldn't have happened. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. If if. Uh, so the Lebanese, ha the, the, so j just a, 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 a very quick uh, explanation of of how the model ev evolved. In after the 1860 uh, uh, massacres in Mount Lebanon, mm -hmm. all the Western countries debark in Beirut, including the French with their army. The Ottomans are anxious not to, uh, to to show that they are in charge of the situation. There was there were massacres in Mount Lebanon and in 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 uh, Damascus. Fuad Pasha, the prime minister of of the Ottoman, I mean the Ottoman uh, prime minister, went to Damascus himself and resolved the situation in a few days. He he shot the the governor of Damascus with his own gun. Yeah, and they stopped. Uh, hanging people when they ran out of rope, so they they, want, they were keen to show that they were in control and that there was no need for European intervention. We're gonna hang everybody. We're gonna we're gonna reestablish. I, just, yeah. I thought rope would be I thought rope would be reusable. No. Yeah. So, so in Lebanon, in Lebanon, when they came to there was a there was a court. There was a court in Beirut and a court in, in Mukhtara, mm. and the proposals were to split Mount Lebanon into either two or three homogeneous cantons, a bit look like the Northern Ireland or the Bosnian solution, that you would have a Maronite, a, a Druze, and an Orthodox canton, or a Christian and a, and a, and a Muslim canton. That mm. was the... Mm. And the Lebanese refused led by the Maronite Church. And the reason is because social relations and alliances in the mountains were not along sectarian lines. People, you have Druze families who are allied with Maronite families, and you have Maronite families who can't stand each other, you know, uh, or, or, Mar or Maronite uh, uh, Zaims who, 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 you know, like now, I mean, you have, uh, the Aounists and the the uh, Lebanese forces, and the, uh, so the idea of them only living in a homogeneous place uh, where they only mix with their own kind was totally anathema to their culture. It was they were trying to. It, this is what the West was trying to impose. So they refused and they demanded the solution, which became the solution which was to have one single entity 
with all the communities represented on a council. And that produced uh, uh, what was called a long piece by, by historians, in, in, in a sense. And uh, another, I mean, another quote from Engin Akali, he called it, he said that power sharing and sectarianism is a kind of Lebanese civility. It's not division. It's, it's, it's inclusiveness. Even look at uh, new parties or new organizations that are being created in Lebanon now. They say we are non-sectarian. What do they mean by non-sectarian? They mean that they include everybody. It doesn't mean that they don't care. They, they go out of their way to have a Christian, a Muslim, a Druze, a Shia, a Sunni, and an Armenian Orthodox. <laughs> but, you know, they, yeah, but Nadim, so it's, part, but, it's part of the culture yeah. that people want to live not necessarily in full agreement and in homogeneous uh, identity uh, or in uh, even in uh, under the same national aspiration. You know, you you can be an Arab nationalist and live in Lebanon uh, in the same way as you as you can be a, a Maronite separatist and live in Lebanon. It's your it's your it's your. Uh, but but going with that and just the, the if, what you're saying is in a way that the Lebanese are more deserving of neutrality. They really want it. That they're so good. If they don't if they don't want it, it will disappear. Right, but the, but then but then the question is. If this is a population that is so cosmopolitan and so diverse and so eager to remain mixed in the 1860s or today, there's no real appetite for for ethnic division the way we've seen in other examples. We don't see an, a return to civil war, even though perhaps all the ingredients are there. There's no return to civil war. That there's a population that is desperate to still try and find a way to live together in some form of harmony and a state that serves its citizens with some basic services and dignity, that neutrality, if, if there's any country that deserves it more, it's Lebanon. And then at the same time, that country cannot get there. Just in terms of international involvement, are, I mean, is it, does it really come down, to, come down to that there's just no appetite beyond Lebanon's borders to get Lebanon to a better place? that you will not see a, an intervention the way you saw it in Austria or Finland or Bosnia or ex-Yugoslavia or Northern Ireland. And there are other countries too, that Lebanon is just off the radar. It doesn't seem to be of any concern and that's why you don't have it as a sort of carefully crafted policy. Because I'm just curious why, just, I mean, the patriarch can say it, the president can want it, uh, the po population can really desperately want some, something like that. And it, it doesn't happen. But that's what I mean that uh, when I say that some processes can be irreversible. That this is the, the neutrality. Le the, Lebanon, mm. the Lebanon we knew, the Lebanon we knew, could be gone forever. Um, and there is no return to what, what we knew if we are going the path towards becoming another Gaza. I apologize to the people of Gaza for using them as an example. But they are hostages to Hamas in the same way as we are hostages to Hezbollah. And there is no sectarianism. In, 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 I mean, in, in, amongst the Palestinians, there is no, there is no sect, sectarianism. And they have the same corruption, the same clientelism, and the same division uh, in, in terms of political division. As we do, so that's why I I, I I think that abolishing sectarianism, was, which is is irrelevant, it, you, you can corrupt people are just corrupt. True, so uh, some uh, people lose because they are losers. You know, you don't have to. <laughs> that's Donald Trump. But I'll, uh, maybe I'll ask one more question to Drew, and we can sort of wrap it up from there. Uh, I mean, Nadim is sort of showing that historic perspective and sort of showing a trajectory that is that is rather bleak um, in your own sort of conversations and your own sort of analysis and all the things that we've discussed uh, do you see it sort of in that direction as well that this is an irreversible trend 
and, and everything we talked about. And that, and that Lebanon is sort of increasingly hopeless in that sense. And that, and that some, to some degree, that it's really, it comes down to whether or not the, the Lebanese citizen today uh, can make a difference or not with Hezbollah armed. And maybe it's, a, it's just, you have to wait until things change so that there's no armed militia guiding state policy and that that could take i mean that we could all live our entire lives and that won't change the fact is is that it's taken decades effectively since 1990 and before 1990 during the civil war we have a political class a lot of it was raised up or empowered during the civil war that has embedded itself in the state over a series of decades to reform and to move lebanon to i don't quite agree that it is it may appear irreversible now. The ship has, there's a lot of inertia. We've talked about the inertia of Lebanese, of the Lebanese state mm -hmm. with the particular client or uh, the cartel mm -hmm. who have their clientele embedded in the system. It's going to take a lot for that inertia to stop. You know, this is a giant oil tanker that doesn't, it's not a speedboat. It's not going to turn around immediately. One or two street demonstrations, no matter how popular and how cross-sectarian or how cross-cultural they are, is not going to undermine the effective power that we see in Hezbollah and in other, in other political actors. This is going to be a decades-long approach. And, we, and, it kind of is, and, I, and I will, for my contribution for, towards positivity, do not see it as irreversible. But I do see it as a very long um, drawn out fight that probably won't happen within our lifetimes, potentially. Um, yeah. <laughs> and going forward, um, whether or not, so potentially it's probably irreversible for us to see the Lebanon that we want. Right. But um, my hope is is that um, that we. I think that to be honest, Pandora's box is being opened. I don't. I think that it was opened certainly on October seventeenth. And it was very firmly um, thrown open on August 4th. I think that the game is up in terms of um, sectarian division. I think the game is up in dividing communities. We've seen that effectively our leadership does not have the best interests of, even as they claim and declare, of their own sect. And I don't think that that cat is going back into, or I don't think that Pandora's box is going to close right. on that. That's a lived reality. And I think that that's something that um, the Zion are trying to adjust to now. And whether or not we can continue the forward momentum to ideally to start capturing institutions and state institutions going forward, that is going to, that's going to be the next step. And I would like you know, to start seeing the um, the changes in accountability in reforms and hopefully an election law that isn't gerrymandered to ensure the replication of the current political class. You know, I uh, <laughs> I, I want to say a few things here, but before oh, before before yeah. completely wrapping up, I want to ask you, Nadim, is that whiskey that you're drinking? No, that's beer. Oh, that's weird. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Whiskey. <laughs> I, I want to. I want to. I want to give you the the optimistic scenario. Tonight, please. But yes. you, you you go ahead first. No, no, no. Let I, I'd like to. Yes. But please go ahead. Problems. The problems of Lebanon are very. The economic problems of Lebanon are very easy to resolve. The financial situation is very easy to resolve. The main problem is political. That that's that's. Uh, and, and the solution, I think, is already there because there is already a revolt against Hezbollah and against the way, the, 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 the way they, are, they are behaving from within their own constituency. And that's the only way you can, you can get rid of There's no way we can live with an organization like Hezbollah. That's for sure. I mean, that's, Lebanon is finished with its existence in the way it is. I mean, with assassinations, with constant war, with, you know, George Orwell's 1984 had a hate week. We have four hate weeks with Hezbollah. You know, we have, it's just too much. Yeah. And they, and, and <laughs> so you need, you need to re rediscuss 
and this discussion is already is can happen very easily. Uh, a new formula of how to coexist. In, 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 you have to have the will to live together in order to live together. If there is no will to live together, then it's, it's finished. Lebanon is not based on uh, Lebanese nationalism. is not based on uh, common language or common ethnicity or common religion or or common hair color or whatever. It's based on the the will to live together. We have to recreate that will. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think it's 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 very it's very possible. And and that's how you will you will defeat. An organization like uh, like like Hezbollah, and the optimistic end is that the region is going that way. I mean, so Hezbollah belongs to the scenario of perpetual war, uh, of of mobilizing the whole society for five hundred years of war until you uh, you know even when you defeat Israel you'll always be want, want war because you want to take over the United States you know you're not fighting only on the Israel you're fighting you know you liberate the south there is the Shema farms and then there will be mm. some, some other tree or so so it's it's a mentality of perpetual war of bearded men in black not not you obviously but <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, who are transforming the whole region into a a, a, a perpetual uh, war situ war situation and and I think the I'm I'm very optimistic because of the Israeli UAE deal because it's in the right it's in the right direction and and it's so it's the will to have. To, to, to move away from these wars which we've been in for the last 70 years we've been in, we've been at war in so the new generation doesn't want to be at war for another 70 years that's that's my optimism you know Haniya and uh, Nasrallah can uh, you know have a meeting and celebrate their victory <laughs> but I don't think the new generation that are hostages to them would want to be hostages to, the, to them for a long time. I've learned a lot. That's my that's my optimistic scenario. No, that is. I think that's yeah. maybe that's the most optimism I've heard from you, Nadim. Actually, because that uh, <laughs> no, because the patience of of populations that are suffering will run dry at some point, and uh, we've been in a situation that's. Uh, far too unstable and abnormal. And um, what Drew said earlier is that the Pandora's box, it's open. And, um, and also there's a, very, there's a very big obstacle that, that is not always in the discussion. And maybe for, for a multitude of reasons, it's easier to focus on corruption or economic reform or even sectarianism than it is to challenge a very, very well-armed militia whose backing is external to Lebanon and is involved in multiple countries, and uh, doesn't mean to sideline the issue altogether, but I think I, I mean I get it why it's 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 beyond the average Lebanese citizen's capabilities to rein in uh, a militia that is not a civil war militia. This is a regional uh, army. All that said, uh, I've learned a lot from both of you, um, Nadim. You offer a lot. Lots of uh, perspective that I that I appreciate. I, you know, I just uh, the more I the more I talk to you, the more I think about my own sort of preconceived notions, whether it's particular words or or just in terms of emotional perspective. Um, this includes a topic that we did not discuss, which is the special tribunal, and we had a private exchange, and you made me think twice about my own sort of emotional reaction to to the verdict. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate mm -hmm. your ability. Whether it's charm or, or other or intelligence or a blend of both, you get me to rethink my my own ideas. And Drew, I've learned way too much from you. Uh, you know, open, no, because I say this and I, I mean this. There are other stories that that I mean, the fact that you you can dance between Belfast and Beirut and show obvious commonalities that I don't I don't see right away. 
And that, mm-hmm. that I mean, there post-conflict uh, stories, and obviously Northern Ireland is, is one case, but uh, mm-hmm. I, I learn a lot from just taking myself out of the Lebanese uh, paradigm and, and looking right. at uh, stories that have worked to a degree. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've had several conversations on, uh, on, on geopolitical quagmires that are less hot, <laughs> but there's a lot to learn there. And mm-hmm. uh, your pracademic approach, and that's a word that I... I quote, I quote you to you, putting yourself. Good, thank you. Putting yourself yeah, in the story. It's a, I mean, it's a very good word. Yeah. You're you're probably you're the most in, you're one of the most involved uh, Lebanese uh, uh, diaspora, let's say, uh, that I've seen in various outlets now, whether it's different podcasts or different media, and you're expressing your own frustrations, and and they come out mm. and they come out eloquently. I can butter I can butter your bread at the start with uh, you know the the uh the um the complimentary words for the podcast you'll keep me you give me that little bit extra in the edit and the good news is i'm good at cosmetic surgery i always find a way to to shorten the episodes just to the right length so you are lebanese in actual fact okay that is what i do for a living yes (laughs) (laughs) when the nose is just a little too big you just chop it off (laughs) exactly yeah yeah yeah. it's far too arab looking let's get rid of that yeah exactly no, but thank you both for your time, and uh, as always, it's it's thank a privilege you. to hear your voices and to gauge your minds. So thank you, Nadim. Uh, thank you, Drew. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank Pleasure. Thanks for listening, and a friendly reminder to help support this podcast by contributing through Patreon or PayPal. All links are in the details box below. Until next time. I'm Rani Shatah, and this is the Beirut Banyan.